Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our, pro our protocols observed. Lovely to see you here today. Um, it's a wonderful start of the year. I will still say start of the year because with January, I think the whole of January is pretty much the start of the year. Um, on this last day of January, we're revising, reviving a tradition which was in operation a number of years ago at the university, which was the weekly research seminars. So when I came to work here, I heard wonderful things about the weekly research seminars and um, was very much looking forward to eventually um, it starting again. So with our 15th anniversary this year, the weekly research seminars are back. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite the Vice Chancellor, um, Ms. Joelle Perrault, to say a few words as we launch, or relaunch rather, the University Interdisciplinary Research Seminars. Without much ado, I would like to invite the VC, then um, introduce the speaker for today, um, Dr. Michael Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for uh, introducing this uh, event. I think this is a very important day for all of us because uh, those who are here for years back, we remember that we used to have on Wednesday afternoons what we called research seminars. At that time, I think we had one research institute and that combined the free oil and education uh, and ECRI, it, it was called. And uh, Dr. Gemma Simeon started it. It was a bit of an initiative and uh, she invited any, any uh, presenter from all fields to come and, uh, and, and present whatever research they were doing or any projects that we had going on. I remember with the Department of Languages, we presented three of us uh, a paper, but we were very much alone listening to ourselves. But what we would like to do is relaunch it, as Christine has rightly said, and have every Wednesday afternoon for research presentation so that all institutes or anybody internally uh, doing any research would like to present, or our guests who visit us, or our colleagues from Seychelles, like Dr. Purvis, who has always attended our and has presented also. So we would like to invite or re-invite our station researchers or anybody else to come and present. We would like for this to be a national Wednesday afternoon research seminar opportunity. We can start it here on Athens Royal Campus, or maybe it can be organized at ICP Center at site or at the National Library or Alliance Française. But the thing is, we keep it as a routine and people would propose to the research committee their papers and then would be scheduled to present. So when you receive our new calendar that has been approved by Senate, you will see that every Wednesday afternoon is for the UNICEF Inter Interdisciplinary Research Seminar. And this will be managed by the Research and Innovation Committee 
um, uh, with faculty and our other partners, the other sections. So it is important, it's an important day, I think, for higher education in Seychelles because we do a lot of research, but we don't talk about them enough for people to know what's happening. So it's, today you don't see SBC, but you see Nation, and I'm happy uh, because it's also one of our students, some of the students, but also working from the Nation newspaper. And thank you very much for being here. So you will have the privilege of presenting this very important occasion to everybody. And uh, we were filming, and I would really like for every Wednesday the presentation to be filmed because we have our YouTube channel, we have Facebook, we have other er areas and places where we can place the presentations. So I really hope that this would be will become popular and famous and respected. It has to be at the highest standard possible. Okay, so thank you for attending. We very much UNICEF, and this is also UNICEF. But we would like for other people also to attend because by listening to somebody presenting his author research, we all know that we learn a lot from, from that, from the methodology, from however the, he or she did the research. So today we have the honor of having Dean Hall being the first presenter and also being the chair of the Research and Innovation Committee. And I know next week we have something on AI that we would like everybody to attend. So I think we need to advertise this as of tomorrow. So let's make the most of it. Even if you haven't done an official research, you've tried something in doing your studies or whatever you want to propose as a presentation, I think you will be allowed to, to do that as well. So let's encourage our colleagues to come present. And also let's talk about this Wednesday afternoon. Let's share it to everybody who would be interested to come in listen to, to our presenters. So I hope this will be a successful Wednesday afternoon every week. Uh, and we are celebrating our 15th anniversary. So today we launched this first one as our 15th anniversary first research in inter interdisciplinary research study. So a lot of pressure on you. Thank you to Christine and uh, who has been sort of leading this to make this happen today with the other research institute directors and also faculty coordinators and marketing and everybody else who have helped to make this happen today. So let's enjoy listening to Mike. Thank you very much. Okay, just to add to what the VC said, to add to what the VC said about information relating to the seminar series, so the university website will be populated with the list of speakers. As we progress throughout the year, you'll be able to see who the next speakers are and also see their bios and what they're going to be speak, talking about. So that will be a sort of a permanent link to, um, that will be um, made available, I guess, by the next seminar next week of where anyone can go and have a look of what, what's happening in the space of weekly interdisciplinary research seminars. And also um, as, each research institute organizes weekly invites a presenter and Michael on behalf of Esri be just coordinating order for this week. Um, say thank you very much to um, Dr. Hall for um, sharing uh, best practice in uh, practice-based inquiry in relation to um, the developments in educational research, which is very pertinent to what we do as, as a university in general, and also specifically with ESRI as well, what we try to promote in terms of research and um, supporting research and education. Now, I'll read your bio. Dr. Hawk, thank you for sending it to me. <laughs> okay. In 2015, Dr. Hawk first joined the University of Seychelles as a senior lecturer in business studies, managing the postgraduate business programs, MBA, and teaching on the MA Sustainable Tourism Program. In 2019, he moved to Malaysia, working as the Director of Teaching and Learning for the School of Education, University of Nottingham, Malaysia. Dr. Hall returned to Seychelles to undertake the role of the Dean of Faculty of Business and Sustainable Development in April last year. Throughout his career, he has supervised over 100 undergrad, master's and PhD students and their research dissertations. His research interests include management development, strategic management, 
teacher leadership, the teaching of language across the curriculum, the curriculum, teacher identity, and deontological, sorry, I mispronounced that. Deontology, <laughs> sorry. Approaches to educational research. Thank you so much in advance, Dr. Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to I'm going to mirror what you know, my colleague by saying all protocols are that's always seems a bit compact. It's not go through the process as well. But um, thank you for giving up your time this afternoon. Um, my name is Michael, and I'm a researcher. And that's an important thing to remember at this stage. At this stage, um, we have. I'm going to talk about multiple identities of what, who we are, what we are, um, just in an IRDs, but we're different. We, we have work in different ways. We have researchers, we have academics and teachers, uh, and it all comes together quite nicely in, in a way. Mm -hmm. the, the concept of practice-based inquiry started off from my, from my own PhD studies a few years ago, where I was particularly interested in what student teachers go through in the two-year period. What happens to them? What makes them become teachers and, and educators? So what I did, I, I, I followed 45 student teachers around, a bit like uh, a little dog, snapping at their ankles about what was happening and trying to observe and I did the, the intention at the beginning was to try and live the life of a, of a new student teacher. These student teachers were, were different. Some were lawyers, see? Some were bricklayers and construction workers, electricians, hairdressers, sociologists, a whole range of different uh, professions. And these people trained to be. And we had one platform. One way of, of training teachers. And we were expected. And what, what we concluded at the end of it is that actually those who are teaching academic subjects, sociology, psychology, language, needed a different approach to those who were teaching vocational subjects, electrical, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, needed a different one. And then how do we train nurses and lawyers to teach? And what is their primary their primary? Identity. Are they a lawyer who teach or teacher who teaches law? And that was an, an important question. The issue with, with practice based uh, inquiry is sometimes we, we, we adopt the concepts of ethnography. I apologize. I'm not going to make any apology, uh, apologies for use of the technical terms because we're going to use those. Ethnography means Observe, observe. You're observing an influence. The problem with observation in this type of research stems from this. Don't try to think it too far, but what do you see? Sandra, what do you see on the board? A young girl, I'm certainly here for the A young girl. Okay, proceed. What do you see? Looking at what? I'm seeing an old bed. An old kite. I see a kid's funny hat. Thank you, Dr. Perlis. Yeah, an old lady with a bag here. Yeah, the bar to know what's in an eye. But then, well, let's be able to see. Sorry, I'm seeing. Okay, so just put your hands up if you can see an old lady. Okay. Put your hands up if you can see a young lady. Put your hands up if you see both. Ah, good. Now there's another couple here, and I'll explain them as to why we're looking at this. What do you see? First thing. Pillars. Two faces. A chalice. Profile. Yeah. Okay. The, the, some of you saw the chalice, some of you saw the profile of the faces at first. It, it's not an intelligence thing of what you see, but the, the message is really something like here 
of where is it six or a nine? Now this is important. This is is a very very short overview of perception. We're all exposed to the same, oops, to the same information, the same data. It's not any different from it. Yet we see different things, and sometimes in research, you get the data and you get the information, or the, you listen to the transcripts from the interviews, and you may misunderstand it. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone where you're talking about the weather or you're talking about how big the trees are, but there's an underlying message going on there, an unspoken message? It's a bit like when you meet someone in a bar. Somebody rather attractive. You meet them, he's like, oh, yes. Yeah, yes, the weather's very nice today. And how was work? You, you're not interested in that. You want to get to know to that person as well. So that's why we sort of look our perception, we have to be aware and try to remain objective in terms of what we receive. <laughs> now, the idea stems back from a very fundamental position. We're trying to answer questions. We're going to answer certain questions or lines of inquiry, particularly about education, or science, or even in the scientific as well. It's, it's the basic goal of any research study. The hard part is developing the, the, the questions. What is it we're trying to find out? What is it we're looking for? There's a, 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 an issue of unreliable and our own complete methods of finding the answers. I think I said this to Shamal this morning. Mm -hmm. I want you to imagine a rule for measuring, measuring distance and a thermometer. Which instrument are you going to use to measure the temperature of water? Both thermometer and a ruler are both instruments for measuring, but there's only one which is appropriate. We have to apply that principle in research methodology. You may be stuck in tradition. Dr. Purvis will be with me on this one. I was told many years ago, quantitative and qualitative studies must never be mixed must never come together. They are both precious metals in, in some ways and cannot be mixed. Nowadays, we're seeing many, many mixed methodological approaches, maybe biased and work to quantitative or qualitative, but the pressures from industry and our stakeholders is, is demanding. They want to know the number, but they also want to know the rationale and the reasons behind them. So the tradition, authority, Particularly when you are conducting, if we are conducting work in the workplace, but you can see that maybe our position, if the, if the vice chancellor walked into your classroom to do an observation, what's our reaction going to be? Oh my God, what's happening? Something's wrong. I'm, you know, this person is is very senior and can, is, it, there's a sense of panic. Right? There's a, we we teach in management. Uh, a gentleman called Smith, who was a pig iron factory, so lots of rocks. And his job was to move rocks of a pig iron ready for processing from one part of the yard to the next. And he had a wheelbarrow and a shovel. What happened then was then a guy called Frederick Winslow Taylor started to watch him. That's time and motion studies. What, what was he doing? How was he working this way? Now, Smith normally used, but normally moved three tons of pig iron per day. When he was being watched, it increased to 13 tons. Just through, didn't do anything different, but the fact of being watched changes people's behavior. Teachers, you know what it's like when inspectors come around. The, the, even the kids change as well. So authority, our position, can affect the, the data as well. We have to have something called common sense and reasonable practice. Um, and what would the, the, the what would the, the reasonable outlook do? So it's important we get reliable and accurate information. It can only come from a reliable source. So the selection of your participants is, is, is really important. Do they fit their participant criteria? And having a systematic and objective process. Now, we've got to be careful of the word systematic. 
because when we're conducting literature reviews, there's two general approaches we can use. A systematic approach used in quantitative studies or a narrative discourse approach in qualitative studies. So if your study is generally qualitative, your, dis your literature review is going to be followed up. And now, John Dewey, we, we, I think everybody's probably heard of Dewey over the over many years. Each claims there are five ways to, to develop a scientific approach to any form of research. The hardest bit, and the hardest bit for PhD students and master's students is actually determining what topic it is. I know all of you who are about to undertake your PhDs, master's programs, or super, whatever you do, this is the hard bit. What is the subject about? What is it you're trying to find out? What question do you need? And then I even state a hypothesis. And with a hypothesis, we tend to think, well, it's probably true. You've got that good reaction. You think you think it's, you know, it's, it's probably true. We then go through the process of hypothesis testing. Well, how do we test that hypothesis? And, and a, a few of my colleagues from uh, other universities I've worked with have had these hypotheses and say, oh, um, vocational education is, is the way to go. And, and I've really liked, quite liked the hypothesis. And when they've done the test, they've proved it, they've disproved it, and they don't like it. But they have to, they have to report on those. So hypothesis testing is testing what we think might be true through a, a series of verification methods and testing methods as well. We need to collect, analyze, and interpret the data. With qualitative studies, a lot of that an an analysis is analyzed at the point of collection. When you're interviewing somebody and they're telling you what they think, what they feel, you're already starting to analyze it. Whereas with quantitative studies, with numbers, we can apply statistical methods as well. We're going to find conclusions derived from analysis. And the last PhD I examined for leaving Malaysia was where the candidate said, I have proven beyond equivocal doubt. But, uh, um, this is the point. You can't do that. You know when you're when you're writing in academic ways, you're using words like may, could, show. Because your your position is always going to be questioned and argued by somebody else. So conclusions are the right derived, and then from conclusions, we're going to reject or support the original hypothesis as well. So it's 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 quite an interesting process and quite simplistic, which can be applied to either quantitative studies or qualitative. So what we need to think about, particularly in Education and in business as well. What is what is the topic which concerns exists? What is the main topic in education? So you might say here in Seychelles, well, the main topic of education, or uh, one of them is drug ed education. How do we inform our young people about the dangers of taking drugs? Do we ignore it, hope it goes away? Do we address it by addressing it? Are we raise an interest in that? These are some of the questions you have to think about. Um, and there are lots of difficult questions. It can't always be about water quality, air quality. We need to address the problems which are affecting the national priorities. How can we help the country with the national priorities? Then we need to specify what is the problem. So you'll see a lot in the, in the, in the, a lot in the thesis, I'm looking to proceed here as well. We'll have a section in, 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 in the introduction, the problem statement. Specifically, what is the problem? We formulate the research questions, all hypotheses about the problem. What is it we want to find out? And this is really difficult. You have to work with supervisors very good. Those of you who do supervise, you will have spent time and pain very much over the development research questions. Collect, analyze, inter interpret the data, state the findings, and you can see the emergence of the chapter, chapters. And then drawing conclusions onto the. Now, what educational research is? It is actually scientific. You may think, well, how can education be research with scientific social sciences? 
is embedded in sociology and psychology along um, psychology there's lots of numbers statistics to and to use but it has to be given as a, a, a specific question purpose of goal what is the aim the objective of the, of the research it different it requires a plan collection again of all the data and it can be uh, cyclical or healthy I've not said that properly. I'll blame my bad voice. But it's not a linear process. You don't start at point A and get to point B. You may have to repeat. It's a bit like the spiral curriculum. Year one, same subjects. Year two, and you sort of go broad and shallow. Year two, you go a little bit deeper. And year three, very deep and then and so it's definitely not linear, objective, inquisitive, and original. And the way we find out about is this subject original? And those of you who have done master's PhDs and are about to will know the only way you'll find out whether your work is, is original is through the research and the readings. What has been done? You have to do an extensive literature review to find a gap in the knowledge. You can't get away. It should be very faithful, meaningful, and significant, and particularly with practice based on it. Is, is it designed to solve a particular problem? Now, some of the, some of the, um, the examples I can give you, particularly for teachers, do students prefer virtual or hands on? There are sections from the biology clubs. And you can come up with some form of hypothesis. It's, is it safe to say that would be more interesting than just trying to explain that as well? But how do we know which technique results in better academic performance, practical or academic? Can virtual dissection be used effectively to supplement hands on dissection? Was not really. the, these are the things that we're doing. And that is virtual dissection more effective for boys than girls. So it always brings up interesting concepts. Did you know girls outperform boys in every stage of the education system? From crash right the way through to PhD. But did you know men occupy the most senior positions? In industry, in education, in politics, in diplomacy, the whole range. Is there a relationship between educational attainment and occupational success? What happens? Why are girls still hitting the glass ceiling? Why do men do particularly well in female do do uh, dominated occupations? Sorry, I beg your pardon. I know I'm going to get caned after for this. <laughs> but these are some of the questions we, we need to ask. Well, and they're uncomfortable. Well, it's not. It doesn't have a predetermined outcome. You're not there to prove what you believe in. You have to have an open mind. And I think that's true for every part of research. It's not simply just gathering information. And the skill is. What information already exists. So looking at, uh, at thousands of pieces of literature and reading them very quickly. And it's not necessarily the conclusive. Brian, what's the best way to teach naughty boys in class? This is a teacher coming out. So how, how should we teach naughty boys? Kick them out, beat them up. Does that work? Does that is that a motivator for boys? Well, no, it can't be, you know, it doesn't happen, but it has happened as well. Um, it's, it's a very difficult question, isn't it? What, what you do is the different approaches. Um, and, and when we talk about gender in teaching, are women generally softer than men? Some will say, Yes, women are naturally caring and things, but men uh, will go out um, and do all sorts of stupid things. Those of you who have taught before, who gave you the most problems in class? 
in terms of behavior, boys or girls? It was always boys. Boys did the most stupid things. And, but, but in a different way in some ways as well. So these are it, the, the questions you've got to see, and it goes back to the early slides about what we perceive to be true. But it, it cannot be trivial. We're, we're dealing with probably the second most important sector within, within society. Health, education, um, really, really important as well. Now, when we think about the, the research as, as a process, we need different methods. The ruler and the thermometer. We need a different approach for different questions, different situations. So, the quantitative versus qualitative argument. Is, your, is the study going to be generally quantitative or qualitative? The key word, and I want you to turn this away, quantitative is synonymous with the word deductive. Now that, in, in my view, is when you look at a list of statistics, examination results, whatever, you have to deduct a meaning. But what does it actually mean? Uh, uh, Dolly Burt has, has sent out some preliminary results from the A-level sector as well. And we, we're busy trying to make sense of it. Have it improved? Has it declined? Has it, should we use comparison as well? But deductive reasoning works from the broad based ideas, concepts, observations, experiences to more specific conclusion. And it has a top-down following effect. Has anybody come across this before? It's, it's difficult to see. It's called the research onion. And it, it represents an onion of where we can peel back the different sections within a methodology chapter, a methodology section. So when you're thinking about it, on the outside, we have the philosophies, positivism, pragmatism, interpretism, and realism. So all the isms are there. Once we've decided that, we've got to think about it. a deductive approach or an inductive approach. We said the word deduction is synonymous with quantitative studies. The word induction, inductive, is synonymous then with qualitative studies. And the reason behind that, you have to deduct conclusions from stats, from figures, but from the inductive, the qualitative elements, is very much about asking questions. You're starting, you're inducing the conversation. So when you do these in-depth conversations, it, it becomes quite, you have to start thinking about your inductive, the lines of inquiry. So um, Dean Zilli, what's the best part of your job? I can, I can, I can pick up and find out. It's complex. Why is it complicated? It's different, you know, different days, it's different, you know, yeah. it's today is the best part, you know, Different times. So it's not like uh, absolute. It's not don't like being as on something that answers the best time. Perfect. So what happened? First question, well, I don't know, I can't tell you. And then all of a sudden, we can't shut them up. Yes. <laughs> so there's a lot, and we've inducted that, and you can formulate lines of inquiry. Now, from, from each one of these, you might think about, I mean, have to be careful with the word experiment, particularly in social sciences. To do experiments with human beings or human participants is often seen as not really done on it. Your eyes will have been flickering about this as well. We look at a survey, case study, action research, brand theory, ethnography, and um, so, yeah, actual research. Once we've decided on what, which one we're going to do there, then we have multi method, mixed methods, or mono method. So those are the, the choices we use longitudinal study or cross sectional, longitudinal study, run about five years. So most of the studies we do now are cross, uh, are cross sectional, they're a moment in time. And you've got then all the data collection. Processes, questionnaire, interview, observation. So the process of deductive reasoning and linked with quantitative studies 
we start here at the top and we move down. So we've got quite a broad area to think about. And then as we analyze the data, we come down and we draw specific conclusions. So in terms of qualitative methods, and what I've seen over the years is we tend to be doing a lot more qualitative stuff. There's a misconception that qualitative stuff is, is easy. There's no realised numbers. Who's, who's good at maths? I know the VC is. She calculates the budgets as well. So who's really good at maths? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't shout at me. So it's, it's sometimes people have got a fear of numbers. Some people are scared of the numbers as well, and, and they are not to be. In my view, qualitative studies is doubly as hard as a quantitative study because you're looking at the results through different lenses. It requires inductive reasons. So these two words are synonymous. Development of raw general conclusions about from observations can very limited number of events or experiences. Usually the number of participants is quite small. So, Begito, can you tell me, I have a population at the university of 5,000 people. How many respondents do I need to get to formulate a general, a true opinion of, or a reasonable opinion of the whole population? One hundred and twenty-seven. That's all you need. We have a population of 5,000. And so there is a chart, also I can share it at the next, at the next one, um, about the number of responses you need in order to make a secure conclusion. So you don't need 5,000 as well. The, the thing with, uh, with qualitative studies is it sort of works the other way. You start off with a specific observation and the or the data. Why are the law students doing so well? Let's get that one. What is the reason? Can we use some of the teaching methodologies or what's happening in the to share with other departments? So that's one. So we analyze the data and then we can come up with broad conclusions. Look, this is what this is what we can do. This is how we can move it on. So what are we thinking about uh, about the research process as well? Some terminology. Now, what I found over the years is that some students tend not to admit they don't know what the word means for fear of humiliation, thinking, okay, I should really know that. So I could ask uh, Dr. Fernando now, Dr. Fernando, what is your epistemological position on the concept of differentiation in the classroom today? Knowing him, he's going to, he's going to answer this. No, <laughs> Well, they get the key concept. What does epistemology mean? Monica, what does that mean? There is study of knowledge and the theory of knowledge. Yeah. What is axiology? Axiology. This gets a all every time. You, you're almost there, something. And what it means is the study of values. So, what do people value? What do they hold? I, you know, what is important in terms of education for us? What is important in terms of education for employers? Uh, sometimes we go off in wonderful ways. And then the other one is ontology. What is ontology? Dr. Purvis, you are not allowed to answer. The study of reality, the truth. Now, when you start talking about the truth, it's a different issue. It's a different issue. Right, I'm going to have a go at this. Um, I, said, I said I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. So apologies, you have to listen very carefully. It's a story. 
I want you to imagine there is a, a man and his son traveling down the highway in a, in, in a motor car. They crash. <laughs> they hit the tree. The man is killed in sleep and the son is seriously injured. The boy is then taken to hospital of where the attending physician looks at them, looks at the boys, oh my God, I, it's too much. I need the most, I need the chief medical practitioner here, the most senior doctor in the country. So they call for the consultant, an esteemed consultant, reputable consultant across the world. Comes down, looks at the boy and says, oh my God, I can't operate on this child, he's my son. <laughs> What's, what's happened? The boy and his father were killed, but the consultant can't operate on the child because he's his son. It's the mother. Yeah. Now, when I did that 20 years ago, um, a, lot, a lot of people were saying, why am I you're trying to pull the wool over my eyes, aren't you? That's his stepdad. Yeah. That's his stepdad over there. Because we associated senior consultant as a man. Couldn't possibly be a woman at that time. No, thank God things are changing around in that way as well. Because you have to be aware of those variables as well. Sorry, of, that, of those preconceptions, that perception. Yeah. When I mention nurse, what, what gender comes into your head? The fireman, no, firefighter, it's a fireman. Firefighter, men. Yeah. It's got a chair, engineer, male. If I took you to Nottingham in, in Malaysia, you'd be amazed at how many female engineers, chemical engineers, and actual engineers are outnumber the boys, and they're doing great. Likewise, some of the boys are doing exceptionally well in, in this. Yes. So we, the terminology you're going to have to come up with, in, uh, sorry, to be aware of, and particularly if you're helping students with the, with the yeah. studies, is very much about what are variables. If we turn the aircon off in the classroom, what is the level of attention going to be at my class? It's going to drop, isn't it? Because that becomes more important than anything else. Hypothesis, something we think might be true. Research questions and design. We use, we can use the research, elements of the research onion to develop these questions and, and the design. And experiment and reserve for research design. Be careful of experiment. And it goes back to Nazi Germany and the Germans were doing all sorts of horrible things in experiments. I think Daniel would be able to tell you a bit. So we can have an experimental designs as well, but usually with descriptive studies or comparative studies, we can pair like for like uh, correlation studies, the relationship between two variables and causal comparative studies. Usually you have a control group and then you do something to the other group. So like in teaching and in education, we, we do things like cooperative learning rather than a, 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 a sort of standard teacher deliver get the kids to do something and then we can compare the uh, the, the concepts of experimental design it can include positive experimental designs in, in other words you can sort of a hybrid approach is related to the study you may use a different approach relating to the nature of the study and what you're trying to do so when the environment team are doing what they're doing with mangoes and sea grasses, and so they're going to take samples from certain times of the year, times of the day, with the other considerations, the weather, and, and, and goodness knows all, the, all those things. Sorry, Jonathan, I'm, I'm trying to show off here. But this... <sighs> yeah. And we talked about control group versus uh, non-control groups, but there is the manipulation of the variables to fit what we like. I don't like these answers. I'm going to manipulate that data so that it does. Um, often seen as an academic offence, but you have to be very careful about that and beware yeah. of those perceptual issues. 
So, um, with content research studies, apologies for this, but it's really quite easy. You know, once you get your head around SPSS, which we've got license, we've getting licenses for, um, but even the use of uh, spreadsheets uh, and Excel can do a lot of the, the, the manipulation where you just highlight the row, tell it what you want, and it's, it's there. You can then make sense of that. So we have descriptive analysis, uh, statistics, inferential statistics, populations versus samples, and we talked about and we can share what sample size you need in relation to the population. So our university population, how many, how many people, we've got over 100 staff and nearly 500 students, so 1,500, 1500 potential participants in the university. We will probably need just over 100 completed questionnaires to make an informed decision based upon them. Anything over that, it usually goes, it refers to the data saturation. You're just generating the same thing over it. You, you find it. <laughs> it makes me laugh because so I'll tell a bit of a story. And when I was going for my uh, transfer from MPhil to PhD, Right, bushy tailed, and this was in the middle of Cambridge. And if you've ever been to the UK, Cambridge is a beautiful city, the, the you know the, the heart of British education at its highest. And I said I wanted to adopt a postmodernistic approach, I was trying to show off, to teacher education that changed the way we train our teachers and make them more responsive. This this exam was said to me, what? What are you talking about, you stupid boy? You know, I'm 50 at this time. No, you know. And then the other one said to me, said, yes, Michael, I've been, I've been reading your, your chapters, uh, particularly chapter two, which is the literature review, and chapter three, the methodology. And, and quite frankly, I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> uh, and these, this is how cruel some of the assessors can be of when, they're doing, when they don't understand what you're trying to do. And all it needed was to have two more paragraphs in each of those chapters to explain what I was trying to do, what the concept of postmodernism was in education, and it went through fine. But, you know, hopefully you don't get nasty, horrible assessors like those, but they are uh, as well. Now, when we talk, you may have heard of this triangulation or polyangulation as well. This is where we use different research instruments asking the same questions to see whether we get the right, the similar answers. So we have an interview or we may have a questionnaire. Are they saying the same thing? And, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they say different things. From our multiple students within a school, what, what's the culture? How do you describe the culture in the school? What's, what's happening? What's under the thermometers? Ethnographic studies. One of the best ones I ever came across was done by my PhD supervisor, who worked in a muscle, a massage path, to try to understand why the girls were participating in certain other activities, prostitution. She became so close to them. She thought at the beginning they were doing it to feed drug habits, and it wasn't. It was completely different. It was about feeding the kids. It was about paying school fees. It was about paying university fees as well. But ethnographic studies get you right in the heart of it. Um, you live the life of your participants. You become one of those participants and experience what it's like. You can do auto ethnographic studies. What is it like in the life of the registrar? How would we know what the registrar goes through? We, we would follow it, we would be sitting on her shoulder almost at the time to understand. Grounded theory. Grounded theory. I never got this at the early days. I never really understood what it meant. But it's actually a theory evolved from your research. You've, you, you've managed to think that, oh, well, this is an interesting one from your research notes. Case studies are very popular. 
particular a, a particular school child class is usually one uh, one entity. And then uh, log the oil duct analysis. What do we mean by that? Interrelated results. Does it fit with that? Ah, oh, you said this, and then, I mean, you know, when you're interviewing somebody, you probe, you, lose, you sort of go a little bit further, you ask a different question. Um, and so, but then at that time, when we're analyzing the data at the same time, not to be uh, confused with mixed methodological approaches, combination of both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, data analysis. What we, we I said in the in the opening, but we we tend to use a lot more of these now because of pressures from industry and other stakeholders. Now, as a university, we're going to get much more cons uh, uh, consultants. You know, people will come, companies will come to us and say, "Can you tell us what's going wrong in our HR? What, what's going wrong in our marketing? We have a particular problem here. How can you do that?" We will probably use our um, quantitative and qualitative collection and analysis tools. So quantitative, how you feel, what do you think? Quantitatively, number as well. What it doesn't say here is that one of these may be weighted. There may be much heavier emphasis on the qualitative aspects of the, of the study. And the numbers are just used there to follow lines of inquiry. Action research, very similar. There are lots of uh, textbooks available, particularly in the library now, um, which talk about action research, but and, you know, actually doing some. So we apply a different teaching method in the classroom and see what happens. But the goals can often be very different. You may want to solve the problem. This one, you may want to just find something out in report, but this one, you may actually want to solve the problem. Behavior management, law schools, maths, any any sort of issues related to that as well. What you need to tell your students or your supervisors is that they have to be knowledgeable. Um, and what mistake I've made, I don't mind sharing. Just put your hands up in here if you've ever made a mistake. If you've ever made a mistake, put your hands up. Uh, of course we are. But do we learn from those? Yeah. Girls do, boys don't. Boys keep repeating the same thing over and over again. So it's, it's, it's an interesting concept as well. So um, but learning from our mistakes. Organisationally, we can learn from mistakes. We write policies to try and avoid something which has happened as well. So we have to be knowledgeable about our particular discipline. This is why you always tell your supervisees, the literature review, chapter two, doesn't finish until submission. Because in the Viva, what will happen, you'll get some smart examiner. They will say, Paul, that's what they call it. Paul, tell me about the recent uh, the recent development made by Davenport. And if you don't know it, that's that's it. Yeah. So you've got to be up to date with the literature and tell your students don't stop reading, keep reading and reading and update the literature review until the end as well. Um, one method is reading research articles and publications. We know we do this. There are um, it's part of an academic's life, a DNA. We read all the time and we understand what we do. And particularly referred research reports, reports which have gone through peer reviews within that particular item. Warn your students with an inch of their lives never to quote Wikipedia. Wikipedia is, is almost seen as, you know, the devil's publication bias as well. The reason we don't encourage Wikipedia because it's not peer reviewed, it can be changed by anybody and it can be hacked, it can be done. So avoid Wikipedia as well, particularly within 
And next week, when Adrian is going to talk about artificial intelligence, about how higher education institutions can respond to and teachers good to respond to it. The use of artificial intelligence should be very, very interesting. Let me try, Tanya, I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass you. Uh, nobody's going to say, I just want you to have a look. Can you describe the word educator as opposed to a, a teacher? What do you think an educator is as opposed to a teacher? Good. Thank you. Brigitte is a qualified teacher. Next bit. What's the difference? You're right, but I want to know why. I want to know your train of thinking. I want to know your train of thinking. Why? So thank you. Brilliant, brilliant answer. It's it's a bit like it's a bit like being a lecturer as well, isn't it? A lecturer tends to say you stand at a podium and you talk to people. So how do you know learning is taking place? Well, we do what we just done. You ask questions. Two, you assess. Three, you do something different within the classroom. And then four, you probably publish what you've done. So you're sharing that information. The concept of as educators, as educators, is very different from that of teachers. The, the role of a teacher is, is much bigger than just classroom activities. But us as researchers, we need to learn about the research process, and it's valuable for all professionals because we are always, even in professional services. You will be conducting your research. And Monica, you're doing yours. I know you've been doing research for the last. Two years now? Yeah, whatever. Part of your MBA. Um, being a, a, a practical consumer of published feedback, knowing you're not going to like a lot of the stuff you're going to read in these instruments. The two gentlemen in the book, I know you're doing this exception about well, writing grammar proposals. How do we get money into the university to undertake certain projects as well? Which is something which is going to happen more and more to all of us is either conducting or supervising thesis and, and dissertations. And conducting school or classroom based research, but what happens in the classroom? How do we how can we do things better? How do we get more engagement? How do I get those examination results up? And research can be extremely empowering in professional activity. We, we're professionally obligated to share our research findings as well. <clears throat> we'll start coming to the end, and then we'll have a, a, a few um, minutes for, for the discussion and questions. And oh, hopefully, but I've just got another couple of slides to, to show you and share with you about the complexity of insider research. If just in if just in an I and the registrar and the VC want to do a piece of research, they can be we can be seen as the insider researcher, the inside of the organization research. And this presents us with many problems. One, the power relationship. So if the VC walks into your classroom and wants to do some research, you see the VC and the power relationship. Can affect your performance. Secondly, the way we see our university. All of us in this room feel the university is, is, is a fantastic place to be. It's, it's wonderful. It doesn't make mistakes. It does the right thing at the right time all of the time. And sometimes that might not be quite accurate. There may be things we can do, and we, but we miss it because of our perception of. of now, there are two concepts. One going back to the 
60 years ago, by Bastien in 62. It's not about the agent, the agent being us, the agent of change, the, the teacher is an agent, whatever, the context in which the research is being done. And then, of course, the situation. And one tends to get slightly confused between context and situation. Then we've got to think about organization. What managers do when they're recruiting people, they look at the philosophy of their organization and the individual philosophy of individuals to see whether they match. To so did get a good idea whether they would fit. What are our personal views? Another poll. Please raise your hand if you have prejudices. Good. I'm not going to ask you what they are. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you do have them. What you don't do is you don't turn it into discrimination by acting on it. So I, I don't like people from Oldham. I'm from Oldham, I can say. Why? I don't know. I just don't like why do I not like them? That, that's the sort of response you get. But so in some ways, you have to come to terms with your own prejudices as well. And they can become, you know, they're slightly more, slightly more complex. And there may be conflict between your professional and personal identity when you're doing the research. What you feel you should do as a professional and what you feel you should do personally, what you've been brought up with, the way that your, your values, your judgments. What I think, this is more important, inside the research and has to develop trust. When I was, when I was following the, the, uh, the training teacher the around, the first one, I was, what was that? I was a senior tutor, I was senior like something like that. But it had the word senior. And I walked into this classroom, and it was the uh, PGC. I sat at the back, and there's four to five people in the, in the induction. And all of a sudden, like, what's he doing in? I'm spying. He's giving it that, and it's nothing more than doing wrong. And then I explained to him that I was doing my research, and I wanted to see what was happening, and I valued that. And it took about six weeks. For them to sort of open up, even in the cafeteria during the break time. They started at, at first very guarded about what they were saying, and then second, they started all of the The issue, and I'm glad Daniel's here, is I used to listen to conversations over the water plant. I couldn't use them. Because it was spontaneous, some of it was quite interesting. I couldn't use it. Because it was almost like acting as a covert researcher. They knew I was doing research, but sort of picking up conversations was deemed as unethical at that time as well. But it was interesting to see what they went through and what happened. There are three distinctions uh, on Africa. So with any type of research, then you need the, the shared understanding between the participants, the institution, the funders. Because often funders will put caveats on what you can spend and what you can do. Normal social interactions, you, you're looking at those. How do, how do you remember in your classes that there, there would be clusters of self collecting groups of people, wouldn't there? You know, in England, we'd have the good looking girls all together just sharing the makeup in, in one part of the classroom. And then we'd have the boys that were trying to destroy everything. No, they're certainly not interested. And the teacher's pets, I was at the front, giving you apples, and you know, sometimes you think, oh, God, don't do that. So there were groups coming together inside of that. And we did, our job was to try and break those down as well. It, it ends up, you have a professional working community, PLCs as well. And I think uh, Dr. Purvis has done some work on learning, learning, uh, learning organizations. Um, I read it with interest as well, so thank you. Learning organisations, how do organisations learn? How do they develop? And, and you might say, well, the university it must be a learning organisation because it's about learning. No, it's about how it's managed, how we 
develop policies and practices through making mistakes. So I'm inside of my base of research. So if, if you have students who are going to do or you're going to do that, you have to remember it's a social process and it's done with undertaking with your colleagues as well. It's educated for all participants within the project as well. They're learning about it. What I found is that the student teachers I was watching actually learned a great deal more about education because they could ask questions. And well, what do you think about it? So what do you think? So there's a bit more going on. It's in blue with a technical development dimension. It is about improvement. So it is about moving forward. Focus upon aspects and practices in which the researcher has some control, not all of it, where you can initiate change. If we initiate change on a day to day basis, there's a procedure to do it, but we can do it. We can aim it to identify and explore social, political, and historical factors affecting our practice. What are the drivers? Who says what we should teach? Our Ministry of Education will often dictate the philosophy of education as well. What is the purpose of education? Why do we have an education system? One that you could argue is to provide a workforce for tomorrow. We're going to need a workforce for tomorrow. So we're going to train the people to do the jobs we want them to do. Or we're going to provide opportunities for people to move out of poverty into stability. It's a way of changing life, isn't it? So there are different philosophical approaches. To change. And we're able to open up value issues for some form of critical inquiry. Ask difficult questions. Ask the difficult questions as well. Um, and it gives, in some ways, when you're, when you're doing a piece of research in, in science, it gives a say to the, to the people as well. Because if you try to solve a problem, trying to look at an issue, then it's, in some ways it's helping us. And we're able to exercise professional imagination. What do I mean by, DJ, what do we mean by professional imagination? Sorry, you're on. Are you still on one? <laughs> Where are we going to be in five years' time? You know that famous question at interviews, isn't it? Sorry, where do you see yourself in five years' time? That, that type of thing. It's test, what's it tested? It's testing you know, uh, uh, progression, of the will for the ambition as well. So we can integrate personal and professional learning as well. We learn, with you, we learn it every day. Not just from formal learning, but from social learning at work and from outside, from the church, from youth clubs or clubs or even grandcats. We learn it in a particular way. And the result we find are worthy of interest in much more than wider audience. Don't underestimate it. How important it is. It's why we said at the staff meeting, have a research game profile, whoever you are, it doesn't matter, start to work right through. The people who are involved and what we have to think about when we are undertaking work-based related, practice-based related programs or research, you have to think about yourself. It's hard to try this. Why am I doing this? What does it mean? Your colleagues. The partners and network. You know, every every staff meeting we have, we talk about an expansion in partners. You know, and this is real, and it's difficult to keep. We're going to have to catalogue them in some cases. Uh, professional fields and, and organisations. You look at the word you know, very. How many partners have you got in very? Uh, Eight to ten partners as well. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking just in, in just in faculty as well, the number of partners which are growing is is there's there's so many. And internet when she start talking about international partners and in different universities, is it's incredible. So they may have an interesting stakeholders and masters, the council, the university council will be interested in what you found out. 
they want to know what is the what is the impact and the impact. Where are you publishing? Are you publishing locally, which is great, or are we going more internationally and appear in journals as well? And think about the social one, society, the economy, and the culture. And, and these are three important issues. Society functions, there's a, a there's a functionless type of model which says society is broken up into different cogs, like a, in, a, in a clock or in a car. The cog of health is reliant upon education, crime, punishment. And you can say we need crime for, society, for our society to function. It's not a very desirable but we wouldn't have a police service, we wouldn't have a prison service, we wouldn't have all these initiatives that they've done. The economy, the economy. I read the other day that Seychelles is now the richest country in Africa. Don't feel like it, but, yeah. <laughs> but we must be doing something right. And education is key to that. When you look at the successful societies and economies, education is heavily invested. And culture, the protection of the culture is vitally important. We're changing every day. Society is changing. Um, but then we can't forget where we come from. We can, uh, otherwise, we'll lose that heritage. As well. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to thank you ever so much for being a wonderful audience. Um, I don't normally get too nervous, but my God, I was petrified before <laughs> when it happens. So it, it's, it's been a great afternoon to talk about stuff. I, I really I, I, I love this stuff. Um, I'm fortunate to chair the Research and Innovation Committee, which enables us to do this as well. So um, if you've not got your name down to stand here and do what I've just done, please do so. It doesn't have to be perfect if you're completing your PhD or starting your PhD or considering your PhD, think about a research topic as well. So I'm going to open the floor up for, for questions uh, or debate, conversation. It's about the individual and the research, researcher. How you call readings? And uh, we talk about a lot of things. Life is about social construction. Yeah. And human being is a political thinker. So, either he's a religious thinker, either he's a political thinker, or non political teacher, or anything. It's about his knowledge, how he puts it. Yeah. It's his own research. And he educates. For example, the politician will be educating the society what to do. Yes, the French standards. But we know that we are religious who uh, contributes to the society through his religious learning or philosophical learning, but we might not agree or agree. So, how do you define an uh, educator and a researcher on this point? Like, just brought a few sociological points which you can't philosophize. I, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, thank you for such a difficult question <laughs> at this time. Ben. But it, it's, it's an interesting thing when you think of the word educate. So you think of the word educator, it embraces much more than teaching and lecture. It is sharing of information and, and something we've not been particularly good in the sector is actually sharing how we teach, what methods. You know. When was the last time we, we sat in a, in a staff meeting and talked about teaching? Now, it's very, here is not too bad because just then it's a bit of a tiring. I want to talk about that in the time. But in other institutions, we would talk about budgets, we would talk about uh, recruitment targets and why such and such a body. We never really got down to talk about teaching and how to teach and share. But the, the concept of an educator is somebody who teaches, who shares, who explores, who researches. As well, so I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Yes, Sammy. Any government now? It might be a fresh 
the site. How we actually have a space for the public. We cycle in the double check. West, you can find the guy in the YouTube. So, like, the difference between multi member and mixed member. Sorry. Um, thank you. I'm conscious I've missed that one. Multi what, what you have with multi method is a quantitative or a qualitative study, but you're using multiple methods to collect the data either through questionnaire, survey, observation data, but it's all genuinely qualitative. The concept of mixed methodology is where you have quantitative research um, methods and qualitative, and they can be weighted. So you can have much more emphasis on quantitative or qualitative, and it, it's, it's expressed we express it by diagrams, by the thickness of arrows and upper cases as well, which shows immediately that this topic start and, and it can be sequential. Do you start with the quantitative and then so you've got the numbers and then you move on to the qualitative and you want to know why? Why have the numbers decreased over that period of time? So multi-method, quantitative or qualitative, but different approaches, different research instruments, mixed method. Combination and quantitative and quantitative. Yeah, yes, in one, there is a quantitative. That has been the same in the world. But in many other sectors, say, mixed method is one of the important things for For instance, if quantitative is more heavier than quantitative, why should it be called? Where do you find the balance? Qualified. Yeah. Thank you. Because you can't, you can, you can weight that. You can say ten percent of my study is going to be on the on the quantitative element. Ninety percent is going to be the, the qualitative stuff. And as long as it's explained and the purpose of that methodology chapter is for you, for your students to explain and justify the chosen methods, and they have to. You have to show. Your appreciation of the alternative approaches as well. Why didn't you? Why did you choose a questionnaire over opposed to a to a an interview? What you know? What are what are the benefits of the interview? No, you know when you write an interview when you're doing an interview. If the VC inter starts to interview BJ, he's likely going to tell her what tell tell the VC what he thinks she wants to hear. He's not going to say, well, <laughs> Friday morning's for VC, but well, what I do is I, I go shopping and then you know, I'll come in and sign up. He doesn't do this, I promise you. But it's, it, it, in some ways, it inhibits the truth or the real thing as well. What you have to, what I said before about breaking down to trust is that where they, the participants can open up. That's what okay. it's done. Yes. My comment relates to the last and the vision of research research. And I think it's more of a culture that we want to apply to the work that we've done in the previous researchers. So yeah. I can give an example. Maybe someone is researching the topic of sessions, and then say, no, we have the problem of being out there in the community. But you have resolved from others. Sometimes people are not tempted to change it so that it aligns with the problem of being yeah. rather. Yeah. On top of it, why the result is the way it is. Yeah. So I think that's one thing that we have to be careful. Yeah. Uh, being that solution before I have a result that was like, deviated from the law, but I stick to it, and I have to find out the reason behind it. Really. I think that's something I didn't cover, is that you may have to amend as you're going through the research program, getting in the data. You may have to amend your process. And but, so be mindful of that when you're supervising. Um, masters and, and, and particularly those that were about to start on the doctoral students as well. Now, so we know that most of the research is going to be the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the desire with it and, and the, the, the the executive team that discussed this is that we're looking to unlock 
and uh, project funds. So you know the difficulties we have with WLP is about non-funded as well, where we can fund research projects for early career researchers as well. So they put a they put a project in and say, I want to I want to I want to survey the trees and or whatever whatever that is, and this is what I'm going to do. We can give money once the one if we do have a fund to that researcher to go off and do it. The VC is going to not kill me, but will speak to me in a, <laughs> in a way, if I don't mention this, that there is a national research fund, which is, and we think is going to come to us, for us as a committee to manage, so people from outside, as well as UNICE staff, can apply for funding for, for research projects. So I think we mentioned at the staff meeting, it's about, you know, this year is going to be about growth, it's good, we're going to build, we're going to do it, but we're also going to try and enable researchers to become much more active as well. And this is why we're inviting people from other institutions to come and talk, talk to us about their research. It'll be good for them because they're going to get a classroom full of experts who can help them and give them advice and questions. Thank you. Um, Brigitte, proceed and then. Sorry, I'm going to break. I'm going to break our protocol. Not a purpose. No, no, you've jumped the queue. What about the issue of this being a very small, small community and the effects that that might have? Uh, the the closeness we have to each other and the uh, the, the short distances between government and how um, to what extent does that affect the kinds of research? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 it, it does. It it sort of branches onto that concept of power relationships as well. You know where we. Lots of us work on different committees as throughout the country and community service, I think, and referring to as well. We have to be mindful of those power relationships and the effects of what's, what's happening there and, be, and even more objective um, as if we worked in a much larger organisation, bigger university, where we become quite hidden in some ways as well. Everybody here is very well known in the country as well. So we're under additional pressure, I think, and particularly what we, you know, what we do have is a very good subcommittee here for research ethics. They do a lot more than they should. They actually give advice on what they should be doing, and their, their remit is just to say, is this project ethically sound? <laughs> but I think the next stage then is training of supervisors much more to, to become much more effective as well. The other thing we're going to propose is that we open up um, research methods teaching sessions to other students to come in and, and, and audit. They can sit and listen, and, but they don't have to uh, sort of go through formal registration. Just something to give them a little bit more profile as well. Thank you. Amazing. There is a thought that there is nothing new under this one. So, what do we do? Which stage? Um, so, which means, you know, we change just one small aspect of it, and we change the next of it. Now, like, do we, like, when we search at the end of the noise, can we do the same thing yeah. as yeah. when we do the next of it now? Or is something that's been done to the next? Ten years ago, everybody has been researching the Kenyan yeah. and now things have changed. The condition that yeah, yeah. And we need to be able to answer that one. So, yes, you can repeat studies which have been done before, and, uh, and to see. So, if you look at sort of studies which were done in 1911, at the time of the mm -hmm. just just before World War One. You, the, the the studies that can then be repeated now to see the difference. 
it, um, or you can use you can use the the questionnaire, um, which has been developed for say leadership training or skills analysis. You can use that in your different contexts as well. So, but the only way to guarantee originality is to look at the existing knowledge. What do we already know? What is already published? Um, it's hard work. It's long. It's laborious. But the key is reading the abstracts. So when you look at journal articles, look at the abstracts, and they're usually free. To see whether you want to, is it covering? Is it going to? Is it going to? And then don't forget the abstracts. It's the whole thing in a very short uh, paragraph. So, so there's no easy way, and every research um, topic and every research is is different. Is different. And we've got to be careful now with artificial intelligence um, but, and turn it in as, as managing to detect anyone who's used them. I say, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, I have uh, a question. I will start with uh, my contribution. So, which is also important to me, to immediately start with it. In terms of both space and time, but of course, uh, depending on your, on your topic. Um, and uh, now, tell me my question. You have talked about your hypothesis, assumptions, and uh, how do we test the hypothesis? And what do we use to test the hypothesis? Well, it, it depends on your research. One, it depends on what you're testing, what, in terms of the hypothesis. So what's something you think might be true? So for example, you might say, really the, the simplistic one, boys are, bit, are, are getting better examination results in human results for, for, for a moment, for example. So you think, oh yeah, the, the boys in the class are more engaging and they're, they're bound to get better. I, my gut reaction is they're gonna do better. So then you go and test, you go and look at the results and you compare and you look at them. So to answer your question, there isn't one specific way of hypothesis testing. It, it's how you build that methodological approach. And in, in, in that way, related to the question. And I always remember the ruler and the thermometer. Is that appropriate method to test and answer that question? You have to have the, once you've got a hypothesis, you have to have the questions, and then that will determine the tools you're going to use as well. And to throw something added into it, you might look at it from a feminist point. And that becomes really interesting. Yeah, and that's why you, you may need to use a multi-method approach and the triangulation and polyangulation. So, okay, well, this, this survey is, is to, to one, and that's, uh, I'm, I'm really conscious of time. So, shall we just have one more? Is there one more question? Oh, don't resist. Okay. Um, of that humans, let's say. Um, so you come at it from that angle and, and, and the content has to be quite technical um, to the methods and tools and so on, which is, that, that's great. But stripping that way in terms of the purpose of why we do research, yeah. irrespective of what approach we use and how we might improvise our students, obviously, because we're at university, your, your emphasis is on students doing research to and part of their study. And so they have to comply and perform to uh, 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 introducing uh, 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 the product. It becomes a product, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so the purpose ultimately of doing a bit of research. Is it produced that kind of product which then gets set? And that is a very different approach to research than some other people do research. Okay, like Dr. Dalton, who would do research for uh, 
Here in the university context, yes, most of our students are doing it to the box because of the past program. Yeah, I think I, yeah, sorry. Here, as a supervisor, often what I have to explain to my students is that research can end up being quite contrived because you almost have to think of the end when you're already still doing the beginning. You know, you have to look at it, what is the energy product going to look like? And sometimes, you know, even though it, you have a methodology and you have to talk to quite theoretically about the methodology and so on, then any products will almost be oh, we should them doing that. So, you know, that that is one approach to understanding how we said it was done. But if we think we Look at it in a bigger picture. We talked about society and autonomy and culture, and we want to actually have educators make a difference. Yeah. You know, a lot of our research ends up on shelf, it ends up, you know, yeah, you see the box in a month. But what happens with that research? Well, this is the new trend in, in terms of research. If when we look at, at, when you talk about the product, the end result, so what we said at the beginning is that we would identify a particular area of concern, a particular problem. And then in the final chapter, for now, we would have conclusions followed by recommendations. So what happens? So if something is initiated, something is done based upon that, of course, there's going to be research, pro uh, research projects, which are just going to sit on the shelf and, and gather dust and never be looked at again. The British Library is full of those as well. But the modern trend now, particularly um, from private funders, NGOs, which Barry Haas does quite a lot of those as well, and even the, the, the business, they're looking at particular problems and looking at issues of particular problems. So what, what I've tried to do is to look at the way we can deal with them, the way the approaches we, we use. And I'm assuming that all of us at some time will either be supervised or be supervising. <laughs> And so so in, in some ways, I think that's why I've tried to put it in, a, in an educational context. I think 90 minutes is, is too short. So we need to show this transition from the research to the application of the implementation of the visitor in the urban and like in education. So we need yeah. 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 There is there is more to be researchers that is not is not being offered yet to research. We need to take this space. What we need to take this space. This is why it's very sad that SDC didn't understand this. I really hope that when one might stay with you, because those are the presentations that will be shown on TV for people to see. And if I put in this from the research, we actually get involved. What is the way you see? You see, guys, I'm going to follow a research on the trilingual situation in It would be interesting to listen to my receipt of my chief legal research, which is presented to the Ministry of Education and everybody else. What is happening with the now? I know they're talking about this survey say that by the law. It took a long time, but what they all found out is a 
could have answered a lot of the questions that we face now. And not even that they take that more seriously. I think environment community research may be very used that in the policy before in the event of the fields. And maybe also you have to go to show that that aspects that the world is to be a community communication that they should follow the kind of development. That's the easy assessment of what the world should be. Yeah. That recommendation before you know this, that you have to be able to do it in the Because what they are able to share the information, including the things that they have lost, so it's open access. Nobody will say that you have a problem. Yeah. Access grant, that's not going to happen. Which is that that you wish you access to. We have a methodology, we get the result. The result should help with the problem. But very frequently, we don't see this in reality. Now, to get to that, you know, when you're trying to go in terms of um, performing the policy, but being on the ground and speaking to people in different areas. We talk about research being done from the methodology, but many areas will tell you that they have already insider researchers who do not have from the daily research. They go and implement this, they go and just look at studies or some figures. So, you know, there's research and then there's research as well. So, this is really not a reference of this, this is just an observation of what I'm seeing. And it, it, it gives us even more weight in what we're trying to do to help them. The people understand the value of research and research that is conducted in a scientific manner as well. Because yeah. if you could think of this next week, and then you said something, you can post evidence, you found people say yes or no to your questionnaire. How about you tell me, thank you very much for offering the people the Institute to help? But we already love, we don't really like you guys to do long research, short and to the point, because we are practical people. So I was like, okay, but we can't have the meters. This is a practical issue that we have seen in our human model team. It's the lack of awareness of the people. It's also about the connections that are not there. Um, I mean, I, I get that I a lot of workshops and forums of the regulation to at the moment. There's a good economy and there's the, the, uh, the uh, circular economy that's thinking that policies being developed and so on. But in sounds like the university has not even seen the draft in the this. Uh, of this policy. And then there's a lot of stuff when I read it and read through it, and I only came across it last week, put in my this forum uh, in my NGO, so um, there's a lot of stuff that has already been done. There's research that was already been done here and by other institutions that are not even there. Mm -hmm. and I haven't even been taken into account. It's exciting in the agriculture uh, uh, aspect. So the connections are not there. I don't know, I'm not sure on what platform, because we are very small. Yeah. And the, the policy makers and the university and other institutions doing such work are fairly close to each other. But you only hear about those things in a sort of yeah, I just like that. So, I don't know. 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 Why we call it that now? Because when I get with the social people, with the Minister of Finance, Minister of Family and Social, they all they were asking for, for something. And they were doing a lot of research with the patient. So we put them together and people were asked to be connected in the But they're not even interested to link up their research sections to us. Because I said, well, so that's like a Christian way for. Uh, for education, because their section should be working as really. I think we need to be going to be in the environment that we just do that. And they need a new form of connection. This, I think, the different, uh, maybe, reason or whatever. 
but there should be more policymakers being tested. You see, so we, we have a lot of people who are hopefully in the next year, and more like this. Okay. 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 Because already, so thank you, Michael, for this. I just had a question. In fact, I did have a question, which is a comment about the efficacy of the presentation this happened. The first one, the fact that we did in virtual and setting the scene for future presentations to sort of cover quite a lot of the stuff that uh, would allow the future owners to understand. We have different ontology and epistemology, we have different fields of research, but every country needs. So all the future uh, researchers will come here with one or another reflects some of what we're talking about today. So I think it's it's uh, right on its focus, it's actually its uh, purpose for launching the uh, uh, the series of research. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, no, next week. Uh, to our online guests, thank you very much for joining us. I think Conrad's, yeah, Conrad's gone as well. But he said thank you for oh, a great presentation. Unfortunately, I have to attend another meeting. So I'd, um, it's, it's certainly for me, it's, it went better.